today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. The latest as it pertains to Alicia Bumpgartner and the ongoing investigation into her banned substance fiasco, at least according to Alicia. Vindication, the case is closed. Just a few years ago, I found myself struggling to find purpose and a reason to continue fighting. Today, women and men, but more importantly, girls and boys look to me for inspiration to pursue their goals and bring their dreams to life, as I have. When I've spoken of my journey, my fight, I've been blessed to witness how my words impact others and inspire hope. Aww. It's in those moments that I've seen my purpose. I take it as my personal responsibility to continue to inspire, encourage, and support all those who cross my path. As many of you know, a few months ago, I was stunned by news of an adverse analytical finding, AAF, attributed to a drug test that I had taken. After the news broke, I asserted to the world, that I have never knowingly taken any performance enhancing drug, but I still found myself being accused of cheating. I take my integrity and my reputation seriously, and I would never cheat. So those accusations hurt, not only because they were untrue, but also because of what they were falsely telling all who look up to me. These false accusations threatened my reputation. And most importantly, my ability to accomplish the goals I set long ago to make an impact on this world by being a beacon of inspiration to all those who need hope to keep moving forward. Nevertheless, because I know me, I immediately rejected the very idea of what this adverse analytical finding implied. I took it upon myself to learn the facts and got to work. I researched and consulted with knowledgeable friends and experts to fully understand the situation I was in. I learned how urine samples should and should not be handled, how they can yield false results, and how unreliable urine testing can be. I learned about fairness, due process, and my rights as an athlete. I learned a lot. As a result, I gained full confidence in my ability to thoroughly and categorically defend myself against the ignorance and accusations. Last month, the team and I provided the sanctioning bodies with a 22-page, not including 14 technical references, technical report to show in great detail how and why the adverse analytical finding should not and cannot be trusted nor considered as accurate. To date, this comprehensive document is still being reviewed by the sanctioning bodies, but last week, I promised you big news. So here it is. Today I am proud to announce that an independent test of a sample of my hair by a reputable laboratory examined the time period from June through August of this year and has not detected masterolone or any other endogenous steroid in my body. As you read these statements, these results have been provided to the sanctioning bodies. These results conclusively rule out any possibility of intentional doping on my behalf and confirms for all of you that I am what I say I am. What I've stated from the very beginning is still true. I never have and never would cheat in the sport that I love and that I've been blessed with the gifts and opportunity to competitively dominate. I am a strong advocate for anti-doping and clean sport, especially in boxing. This is why I voluntarily signed up for drug testing years ago. However, just as importantly, I am a strong advocate for the fair treatment of athletes. Testing should be extended and further enhanced because all athletes deserve the gold standard in fair treatment testing. Athletes and their teams need to be informed of the specific details of their testing, who's performing it, how it will be handled, and what standards are being applied. The results are too important and consequential to take lightly. What I've learned through this process and what history has shown is that urine sample testing is not the highest quality testing available. It is used because it's cheap, but it's neither the most accurate nor the most effective method to test for intentional doping with steroids. Instead, it's hair sample testing that has been used to confirm results of urine testing due to its superior reliability, accuracy, and ability to identify actual doping cycles. So to those who have supported me and believed in me without wavering, I thank you from the bottom of my heart to my sponsors, Everlast and Box Raw. Thank you for sticking by me and believing in the athlete that you partnered with. To those who doubted me and accused me, I sincerely tried to keep y'all from looking stupid, but oh well, LOL. I'll pray for you 
Anyway, I welcome the sanctioning bodies to continue their review in accordance with their process. However, as of today, I consider the issue resolved. I am moving forward with my career. I am once again ready to fight. I've instructed my management to begin negotiating for my next undisputed title defense. One of the most naturally gifted athletes that women's boxing has ever seen is back. And the queen is coming. My thoughts. Even if everything is resolved, even if everything is exactly as Alicia says it is, you're still going to have boo birds. You're still going to have critics that aren't going to let this go and won't let her live this down. That's just how some people's minds work in the sport of boxing. Once you pop hot, you're always guilty in their eyes. You see that with Canelo Alvarez, Tyson Fury, Conor Ben, Jarrell Miller, so on and so forth. And while this is Alicia's side of the story, in Alicia's own words, we now have to wait to see what the sanctioning bodies decide to do. The burden of proof was on Alicia to give the WBO cause for her to remain champion in spite of what happened when they issued that show cause letter. And if the documentation that she is provided is satisfactory and to their liking, then she keeps the belt, she stays WBO champion. If it isn't, they'll strip her. That's saying that if any of you out there are still wondering whether or not the matter really is resolved, we won't know for sure until we see how the sanctioning bodies decide to act or not to act based on the documentation that Alicia has provided them. If in the coming weeks, she's able to schedule another fight and she's still got all the alphabet titles, well, there's your answer. And it sounds a lot like what Alicia's saying, her research, her independent study. A faulty test or maybe human error in the lab because her own independent testing didn't show any adverse findings, didn't show traces of mysterolone or anything, testing that I'm assuming she paid for out of her own pocket. If those tests come from an accredited lab and they hold up to scrutiny, then she'll be in the clear, at least with the sanctioning bodies and the powers that be. Though in the court of public opinion, when it comes to situations like this, People are gonna still think she's a cheater. Some will. There's not a lot that she can do about that. All she can do is resume her career. And we're gonna be talking more about this in another video. In men's lightweight and super lightweight news in light of Shakur Stevenson's stinker, Ryan Garcia rips Stevenson saying Shakur is arrogant, boring as shit, and needs to humble himself. Shakur Stevenson finds himself on the receiving end of a lot of criticism, this time from one of his contemporaries. Shakur, he's been getting on my nerves since the amateurs. He's so arrogant, and I don't say that about nobody, Garcia said in an interview with BoxingScene.com. But man, he just walks around like his shit don't stink, and he talks shit about everybody and thinks he's some type of dude who knows everything about boxing. Well, if you knew everything about boxing, then why the hell did you not get De Los Santos? He was scared of him and didn't throw any punches. He has to humble himself a little bit. You're boring as shit and everybody knows it. That was boring. That was the best night of sleep I've ever had. Shakur's boring performance against Edwin De Los Santos should not be confused with Shakur not being a skilled operator, a quality operator. He is. It's just that sometimes being skilled doesn't always mean you're entertaining. Shakur Stevenson caught wind of Ryan Garcia's comments and stated, I wasn't being arrogant. I don't fuck with you clowns. What am I coming over to you? I'd be sitting there. Before, if you wanted to holla at me, you could have just came over and said what up. My bad nights, I win. On your bad nights, you lay down. To which Ryan Garcia responded, we broke records and made life-changing money. You broke a record of the least punches ever landed in a 12-round fight and made not even 10% of what we made. Quiet your mouth, kid. Humbling experiences for both. It is true that Shakur Stevenson's last fight broke a CompuBox record for the least punches thrown and landed or something like that in a 12-round fight, whereas Ryan, Ryan, while he might have made a lot of money in his last fight, he did get stopped. He did get knocked out. Shakur S. Stevenson responded by saying, won my third world title in a different weight class, my guy. Let's speak facts. You've never won a real world title throughout your entire career. Congrats on the money you made, but you can't tie my shoes when we're talking boxing, and that money doesn't last forever. Do something smart with it. It's back and forth exchange. 
I still think Shakur is a better boxer, better all around than Ryan Garcia, even if he's not more entertaining or not as popular as Ryan, I would still favor him to beat Ryan in a boxing match, perhaps not in entertaining fashion when having to work around Ryan's height, length, speed, and power, perhaps not, but I would still favor Shakur to win a points decision. Shakur has got to find that happy medium between being a quality operator and being a crowd pleaser, at least trying to be, because you won't get far in this sport with that reputation. You can be as skilled as you want to be. If people are bored and they don't want to see you fight, then they don't want to see you fight and you won't get to make any money. So it all matters as it pertains to Ryan and being stopped by Gervonta Davis in his last fight, yeah, it is true. Ryan made a lot of money in that fight. And he has insisted that he's targeting a rematch versus Gervonta Davis. I want to get my rematch at the right weight. He knows it wasn't who I really was. I'm way better than that, and I'm way better than him. I don't care if he beat me. I'm better than him. Give me my rematch, and I'll beat him. If I've got to go through a Teofimo Lopez or a Devin Haney to get that, then I'm going to do it. As it pertains to Ryan and getting a rematch or not getting a rematch, he needs to focus on his boxing. He does because you made a lot of money in that Gervonta Davis fight. But how much more money will you make if you keep getting knocked out? If you don't patch up those holes? There's a lesson here for the both of them. Shakur needs to try to take more chances and try a little harder to please the crowd. And Ryan, Ryan needs to try a little harder to be a better Boxer. You made good money in that Javante Davis fight, but if you keep getting knocked on your ass like that, the wall is gonna dry up and those paydays are gonna be long gone. You better look good against Duarte. Unless you plan on pursuing a career as a content creator instead of a pugilist, you're on the rebound. You've got to take care of business. And the, it's so biased. That commentary is disgusting. I was disgusted by the commentary. Oh, if Shakur don't throw a lot of punches, he's controlling the fight. If somebody else don't throw a lot of punches, it's... Oh man, he's reluctant. Oh, he's hesitant. It, it's just so biased. Like I can't even watch ESPN fights no more. I, I really can't. It, it's so disgusting. At least on the zone, at least they keep it real. They don't keep it real on 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 ESPN. They just oh, I'm like oh my god, this, this is almost unwatchable. I, I might want to put on mute. And I like Timothy Bradley. I grew up with him, but his commentary, man, you gotta be you gotta be real, man. You you can't be like that. You know, you, you just. It's not good for boxing. It, you know, you got to bring Jack back Jim Lampley and Larry Merchant. Well, Larry Merchant is a little bit he, – he's out there. <laughs> he's talking shit about Floyd all the time. But Jim Lampley, Roy Jones Jr., man, I miss those guys. Man, I'm tired of hearing these other dudes, man. It, it's horrible. It's really horrible. Like, I don't I, – ask the public. Ask the public how bad that commentary is. It is disgusting. It literally makes your stomach turn. I had to turn it off. Immediately after Shakur Stevenson's fight, Ryan Garcia was not the only one complaining about the play-by-play, -play, the commentary during the fight, that it felt like Tim Bradley and the guys on the panel, they must have been watching some other fight than the rest of the world was watching because the way they were talking, it was like Shakur Stevenson was in there putting on a master class when it was anything but. It, it was boring. Shakur Stevenson himself looked tentative and hesitant to engage Edwin De Los Santos, likely due to Edwin's height, length, speed, and power. He knew that he had to be careful with him. And Bob Arum suggests that the reason Shakur performed that way was because he was fighting injured. In any event, Ryan Garcia was not a fan of Tim Bradley's commentary. Myself, I didn't watch the fight with the sound on. I usually watch fights with the volume off, all the way down as to not be susceptible to the power of suggestion. If ESPN, people on ESPN, Tim Bradley included, were towing the company line, they weren't doing anything on ESPN that the people at Boxer and Sky Sports aren't doing, or the people at Queensbury and TNT, DAZN. Showtime and the PBC, back when Showtime was paired up with the PBC. They're not anymore. We see it all the time. I was a little bit surprised that people suggested Tim Bradley of all people. That Tim Bradley was playing company man in all the ways that Queensbury Promotions' Dev Sani plays company man. That his commentary was disingenuous. Tim's usually a straight shooter. He'll tell it to you like it is. Like how even though Artur Betterbeev is the top ranked fighter, he's still picking Dimitri Bivol to beat him, even though Dimitri is with a rival promotional outfit. He's with Matchroom. In spite of that, Tim gave people 
his honest opinion. So to hear this, it is a deviation from what I expect. Because he's usually pretty honest, and that honesty is refreshing in today's more political climate in the world of boxing. Being honest with you, I think Tim Bradley and all the guys on the panel, I think they had a very tough assignment. I don't envy anyone that had to call that fight, call the play-by-play, -play, all the action in a fight where there is no action? Was. No action. There was none. You heard Ryan Garcia say that he wants to run it back with Javante Davis. You heard Ryan Garcia say that he's willing to go through Devin Haney or Teofimo Lopez if that's what he has to do to get Javante Davis back in the ring. I think commercially, a fight between Ryan and Teofimo might do a bit better commercially than a fight between Ryan and Devin Haney. It might. There are plans in motion to try and do this thing at some point next year, presumably at the end of the first quarter or the beginning of the second. I'm not sure. This seems to be a fight that top rank is receptive to. And what stands out to me is that there are some slight similarities between Teofimo Lopez and Gervonta Davis, the man who beat Ryan Garcia. No, they're not carbon copies of each other, Gervonta and Teofimo, but there are some noticeable similarities. Granted that Gervonta is a southpaw, whereas Teofimo, he's an orthodox fighter. What they both are, boxer punchers. What they both are, are counter punchers. Counter punchers that use a shell guard, rolling punches off the shoulder and countering in kind. They're both big punchers. They're both explosive in their own way. I'd say Teofimo's more herky jerky than Gervonta, whereas Gervonta, he's a little bit more smooth. Though Teofimo Lopez, if he's in the right headspace, he could end up beating Ryan Garcia for the same reason Gervonta beat Ryan Garcia. If you go lunging in like that, just throwing caution to the wind, he can counter you just as easily as Gervonta did. Much as he really learned in his time with Derek James, this upcoming Oscar Duarte fight is their first fight together. If the Teofimo Lopez fight is the next fight after that, I don't think he will have picked up all that much from Derek. Yeah, it's a big fight. Interesting fight. But does beating Oscar Duarte mean that Ryan is ready for Teofimo? 